All right. Welcome, everybody. Praise the Lord. Had a great day yesterday, prayer and fast, of course. So uh, as Carlton was saying, we, we expect great and mighty things, don't we? Amen. All right. Uh, if you'd like to turn with me to John chapter 7. In verse 37, some well-known verses here. John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. And some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And so this is a time where Israel is um, uh, uh, celebrating, if you want to use that word, um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would um, go and live in um, sort of booths, I think is the word that it uses in the Old Testament, like uh, they'd get uh, branches of trees and all this sort of thing, and they'd make some kind of a shelter um, uh, for themselves and leave all of their uh, natural life behind, as it were. And uh, it was to remember that they'd been wandering in the wilderness and that God had had delivered them. Now, by this time, it was really just a process. They were just going through the motions as so many as so many do. Um, I'm sure there would have been quite a number of people that thought to themselves, what on earth are we doing and why are we doing it? But they just did it because their parents did and their parents did um, uh, kind of thing. They probably thought uh, leaving your home to live under trees, um, cut down trees at that, might seem um, strange. And I'm sure it did for a lot of people. And they'd forgotten about how God had um, provided for them, protected them, watched over, watched over their, uh, their life and their circumstance and given them uh, food and water and shelter and all of those things when they're in the, in the wilderness. But it was meant to be this time of reflection and this time of, of rejoicing um, in what the Lord had, had done for them. Um, who knows why Jesus did this exactly at this moment, but obviously it was the right thing, a right thing to do. Perhaps he saw that they weren't appreciating what, um, what they were doing, what they had, what they'd been given, the position that they'd been called to as a nation, all of, all of, those, all of those things. And he's really saying, if you want to be truly satisfied in life, then you've got to make me your source of supply. You've got to make me, you've got to make me the focus. Um, talking about this rivers of living water. And, um, you know, obviously it's, it says there very clearly, he's talking about the Holy Ghost, which we have not given at this point, but um, we, we have that, uh, that spirit um, uh, in us, you know. When it says in verse 39, um, this spake here of the spirit which they which uh, they believe on him should should receive, that should there in um, in the Greek really means by fixed necessity. It's not like um, you should go and watch this movie. That's just a suggestion. If you want to go and watch it, you watch it. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. But I think you should go and see this movie. It's not that kind of a should. This is a fixed necessity there's no choice in this if you want me to be the source of supply this is what you must do um no other no other way um and belief as we know will produce a result an end an end result every time um and so he says all these things and uh even in this little few verses here there's opinion and there's contention when it comes to the things that Jesus said and, and does and all, all of those things. And so um, he's the great divide is really what he is. And in that uh, verse 43, there was division among the people because of him. 
Does anybody think that that division has stopped? No, it's gotten more divided, if anything, um, over the over the centuries, over the last couple of millennium. So, Sage, if you would just just put that up. Um, oh, I thought you were really. Oh, I could share. It. Just leave it like that. Try and get rid of that stuff on the right hand side there, the people's faces sort of thing. Oops. Just going to optimize. Yeah. Right, so um, in the United States, there is a, um, a, a continental divide. Um, actually, just go to the next slide too there. So just go to the one, just click on the one underneath them. Yeah, that's it. So there's, there's the, that's the uh, continental divide of the United States. And so uh, we know that the Rocky Mountains sort of go right up, up through that area. So that's the, um, that's the, uh, the particular border that we're talking about this great divide. So if you go back to the other one, so basically what happens is if, if a drop of water falls on one side, it'll end up in the Atlantic Ocean. If it falls one inch to the right, it'll end up in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so that's what, that's what happens. Um, either side, that drop of water, it's, it's set in stone what it'll do. So even, even naturally speaking, we have this thing that's a great divide. And when that drop of rain falls, it doesn't have a choice now. It's going to end up <laughs> where it ends up. There's, 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 there's no going back until it gets, you know, down to the ocean and it might go up again and rain on the other side. But while it's doing that traveling, it is set in stone. There's nothing that that drop of rain um, can do. And so Jesus is this great divide. There's two categories. Are you going to end up in the Pacific? Or you're going to end up in the Atlantic. There's no, there's no sort of alternate. You're going to go to one, um, one or the other. And so Jesus declares himself as this division, this great, uh, this great divide. So um, you can get rid of that now. So you can just put it back to how it was before. Um, great. We don't need it anymore. But thank you. Um, don't turn to this. But in Luke 12, it says, "Suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth." So many people, you know. Uh, talking about peace on earth and all this sort of thing. There is none. There never will be any. Um, what does he say? No, I tell you, division. It's division. It's separation. It's, uh, uh, it, it's pulling apart. You know, that's what, that's what Jesus is all about. He declares himself as this great, uh, as this great divide. When Jesus was eight days old um, and was circumcised there, Simeon said this. He said, this, this child shall be rejected by many in Israel and this to their undoing. But he, will be the great, but he will be the greatest joy of many others and the deepest thoughts of many others shall be revealed. And so the heart of man is going to be revealed by, by Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a separation between those between those hearts and so um we have a destiny but unlike the rain it's not set in stone our destiny is determined by our obedience and our our reaction to uh, to jesus christ and what he told us and what he told us to do there the bible says there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved there's no substitution there's no alternative there's no coming up with some different uh, person or God small g or anything like that. It's 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 this or it's this or nothing. And um, so we've got to be obviously very very careful with our walk in the Lord because we want to make sure that in, in all that we do that we're on the on the right side of the of the division that Jesus came to um, to do. Um, Pastor Godfrey, I, I, I've told you this before, but to um, every uh, every um, sort of uh, talk that or anything I've ever heard him do, really, particularly when he's talking to new people, it's always you know repent or perish, heaven or hell, for or against. No pressure, your choice. Always ends up with no pressure, your choice. Um, and so, and then after he said that for about um, an hour and a half, 
uh, then 500 people come and get baptized. That's typically how it works, uh, which is interesting, isn't it? So, but yeah, so there's this, there is this, there is this division. There's this separation. There's a right way and a wrong way. The world looks at so many things in like shades of gray, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, you know, a little bit of drinking might be okay, or a little bit of partying might be okay, or, you know, uh, a little bit of pot smoking might be okay. And where's the line for okay? You know, you've got to make up all of these, all of these things. Let's go to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16. <coughs> Verse 1, now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, uh, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had worked 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife and he went in unto her uh, unto Hagar and she conceived and when she saw that she had conceived her mistress was despised uh, despised in her eyes and so it, there'd been a child of there'd been a child of promise God had promised that uh, uh, that they would have children and uh, it wasn't happening and uh, it wasn't happening for a long time. It's not like they, pr they prayed for, for four weeks and nothing happened. This is decades in the making. And so they get to this point where they think, I know what I'll do. And that's where the problem started. As soon as they said that, I know what I'll do. And uh, that's where the difficulties um, began. And, uh, I mean, this whole story has got a lot of things in it. There's probably 500 talks that you could give in it. But it's an illustration of division caused by doing things man's way and not relying on, on, um, on the Lord's way. Um, if you look in verse 11, um, the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of his uh, of his brethren so this is the 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 father of the arabian of the arabian people there um in verse 15 and hagar bare abram a son and abram uh, called his son's name which hagar bare ishmael and abram and abram was 86 years old when hagar bare ishmael to to um to Abram and so um, there's this coming up with there's this sort of plotting if you like and maybe they sort of did it you know you, you can't sort of you can't sort of blame them it had been a long time um, but this division is caused because of the intervention of of man there in the next chapter in verse 15 and God said to Abraham he's had his name changed by this by this time uh, and god said unto abraham as for sarah sarai thy wife um, you shall not call her name sarai but sarah shall be her name and i will bless her and give you a son also of her yea i will bless her she shall be the mother of nations kings of people shall be of her and abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old and shall sarah that is 90 years old Bear, how many? The, how many of the ladies here are looking forward to having children at ninety? Anyone? Anyone? You're not a lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'm assuming the answer to that question is none of you. I would imagine. So, but here she is. Uh, this is what's going to happen. And in verse 18, and Abraham said to God, "Oh, that Ishmael might live before me, uh, before thee, if only." What I had come up with, God, would satisfy you. If only my plan to sort of circumvent what you'd told me in the beginning would be, uh, would be acceptable unto you. Um, 
I mean, it's the same thing. You said I would bear a son and there he is. But it's the wrong one and it's the wrong way and it's the wrong plan because Abraham, it's your plan. You're the one that's that's sort of done done all this. Um, you know, he might have said, well, after all, yes, Ishmael's my son. What won't he do? He's he's my flesh and blood. Won't, won't he do? Um, it's um it's uh, interesting that he sort of has these thoughts in his in his mind there. Oh, that Ishmael might dwell before thee. Um, verse 19, and God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear you a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time um, in, the next, in the next year. I'm going to take care of Ishmael, but the promise is through Isaac. The calling is through Isaac. The blessing is through Isaac because that's because my plan is the one that produces the blessing. It's God's plan that always will produce the blessing. Really what we do is we get in the road. We get in the way. We, we try and circumvent. We try and make another path. We try and dig another tunnel. We try and do something when all they really had to do was trust the Lord and, and wait. Um, could we have waited, you know, 14 years, whatever it was, like, like they did? Maybe not, but they, um, they needed to. Um, if you go to chapter 21, still in Genesis now, chapter 21, and verse 1, and the Lord visited uh, Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah, Sarah as he had spoken. Really interesting little way that that was put there, isn't it? As he had said and as he had spoken. He didn't deviate from anything. He did exactly what he said that he would do, as we, as we know the Lord does. And verse 2, for uh, Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, um, Isaac. If you go to verse uh, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said to Abraham, let it not be grievous in, the sight, in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said to you, hearken to her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also uh, of the son of the bondwoman, which I will make a nation because he is your seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a, and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder uh, and the child, uh, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Two very different sets of circumstances and two very different plans produced two very different children. Children of obedience, children of disobedience. Not that they were disobedient, but the parents were. And it it highlights the two circumstances, the great divide in the world, this, in, this conflict of interest that's continually going on. One is born of the flesh. One is born of the spirit, God's involvement. Ishmael, born of the flesh. Isaac, born of God's involvement, if you like. Um, and they don't work together. They can't dwell together. They can't live together one had to go because flesh and spirit they were opposites one had to increase one had to decrease one had to flourish one had to depart 
And so all of these things are sort of happening. And I mean, it's a story of nations and obedience, a story of all of those things, which we're not going to look at at all today. But it's this separation of the ideas of the flesh, the ideas of man, the purpose of man and the purpose of God. And those things aren't going to gel. They're not going to mix. They're not going to work in harmony. They're just not. It's either going to be God's way or man's way. Which one are you going to pick? One leads to one leads to banishment. One leads to the promises of God and, and, and a pathway there. They're the, they're the differences between those two things. All right. Uh, we're going to go back to the New Testament now to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. This is sort of Paul talking about this particular um, incident. Verse 22, Galatians 4, 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the one by a free woman. But he who was born of the, bond, of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate uh, has many more children than she which has an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Um, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Ishmael and Isaac didn't get on, and Ishmael did the persecuting there of, of, of Isaac. Um, nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so he's sort of reiterating all of that. Man's endeavours versus Christ's plan and purpose. They're, they're two different things. God's way through the spirit, man's way through the flesh. And so there were these two sons, two ways, two pathways, two lifestyles, two nations. And even in our natural world, you can see that the descendants of the two boys have very, very different lifestyles and different ways of doing things. There's not that mingling, really, you know, that the Middle East is a distinct region of our, of our world there. And so you sort of take that another step further. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you know, this was talking about children of promise and that. But if we want to enter the kingdom of God, it, it can never be the contrivance of man. It can never be our own ideas. It can't be our compromise. It can't be what will make things easier. What will make it, uh, what did Michael talk about last weekend? Smooth sayings, right? We never want to be telling people what they want to hear. We've got to tell people what Jesus wants them to hear. It's a big, it's a big difference because all of those things, the contrivance of man, they're all, they're all the born after the flesh. They're all the born after the bond woman. Um, in Romans 8, it says you're either in the flesh or you're in the spirit. There's, there's two things that you can be. The flesh is of Ishmael, the spirit of promise. God's intervention, his love, his mercy, uh, his plan, his purpose, his direction, all of those things, because we all have a, we all have a direction. And that direction, ultimately, of course, is to uh, meet Jesus in the air. That's the direction. Uh, all this is just sort of, you know, we're doing the work of the Lord and we're rejoicing in the Lord and all of those all of those things. But, you know, um, in a thousand years time, none of us are going to be caring what job we have or what car we drove, or what suburb we lived in. It, it will not matter at all. Only one thing will matter, 
which side of the great divide did we fall? That's what's going to matter. Are we heading this way or are we heading that way? And um, that's, that's really what's important. Um, we won't turn to it, but in John chapter 3, of course, Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And you might look at that saying of Jesus and go, well, that's pretty obvious. Why would he want to say something that's so obvious? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Yeah. Um, it's an obvious statement, it seems. Why would he say that? Because he wants you to know that if you stay that way, you remain that way, if you fall that way, then you're going to be cast out like Ishmael, not part of the promise. Not like Isaac. And so there's this, this great divide of spirit and flesh. The Bible talks about the war that's going on um, between the spirit and the, and, and the flesh there, you know. And, um, I mean, we all live it every day, don't we? That, that battle going on between our natural inkling, our natural brain, our natural um, ideas, perhaps, and, and, and the things of God. But we've got to recognize, praise the Lord, that we are the children, uh, that we're the children of promise. We, uh, uh, we've been rightly divided. We've been divided. Every single person on the planet is, is going to be divided. Every single one of us. There's 7 billion right now, I think, on the planet. Um, Every one will be divided, ultimately. And... Um, you know, the, the job is to remain on the right side of the, of, of the division, you know. And so no matter what anybody said or anybody does, um, you know, you want to cast out the things of the flesh in order to, that you might receive uh, that promise. The thing about religion, um, and, I, and I've never been, a, I was never religious, so it's, I'd never been to a church. I didn't know anybody that had ever been to one. Um, I'd never seen a Bible, never touched one, didn't know anybody that had ever touched one. Um, you, I don't think you'd know less about, about God than I did. I think it's impossible. But anyway, religion is about building to the flesh. It's about building to the senses. It's about what makes us feel, what makes us feel good about ourselves being told that yes you're good like you are gee that sounds good you're good like you are wow that's that's terrific all right except it's a bold-faced lie <laughs> you're not good like you are you're good if you're rightly divided and that division um certainly initially comes with the uh, the infilling of the holy spirit there let's go to john chapter six uh john chapter six um perhaps um let's look at verse 35 jesus said to them i am the bread of life he that comes to me shall never hunger and he he that believes on me uh shall never uh shall never thirst we've got to recognize that He's our, he's our source. He's our sustenance. If we want to get nourishment, spiritual nourishment, we, 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 know, we know where to go. You know, we don't, need, we don't need to read a whole ton of other books or a whole ton of other things or listen to this person or that person or, or whatever it might be. We have the source of every single answer uh, to every single question you'll ever ask. I am the bread of life. If you come to him, you'll never hunger or thirst. Wow, that sounds pretty, pretty good, doesn't it? You'll never hunger or thirst if we come unto him. He's not talking about bread and water. He's talking about spiritual sustenance, isn't he? Without that, without that belief and trust, we, we, have no, we have no hope. And what's, the, what's one of the greatest things that the world is lacking right now today? is hope that's what it's lacking 
And yet we have total hope. We have complete hope. We have what's called a no-so hope, not just a hope-so hope. You know, it's not like um, let's have some prayer fingers crossed. It's not like that. It's, it's, a, it's a confidence type of thing because we've, we've experienced those, those things that Jesus has done um, for us. That living bread and that living water, the Holy Spirit there, it divides. And ultimately, it divides between life and death. This is how important it is. You know, one of the other things Pastor Godfrey says, uh, the, choice, the choice you have is life and death. <laughs> That's how he preaches to people. The choice you have is life and death. And then 500 people come and get baptized. So that's that's what it is um in verse uh let's have a look at uh, 51 i'm the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever and the bread that i will give is my flesh which i will give for the life of the world the jews therefore strove among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat and people even today strive with how all of the things that Jesus talked about, how are they going to work? How are they going to apply to me? They're obviously looking at it from a completely natural viewpoint. What's he going to do? Cut up his arm and barbecue it? What's he going to do? And so they've got no clue. And people might look at them and think, boy, were they dumb. But look out there. Look at what's happening in the world. Right? These people got nothing, nothing on them, have they? Um, it's a, it's, it's worlds apart between the spirit and uh, and the flesh. Verse fifty three. Then Jesus said to them, "Truly, truly, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day." They must have been thinking, "This, this bloke's lost it." What you imagine what they must have been thinking, given given what they just asked him there. Um, verse 50, uh, 50, uh, let's see, verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of, eateth of this bread shall live uh, forever. You know, my sacrifice, he said, is going to, it's going to, um, divide you it's going to uh, even within your own self perhaps um, divide you um, when you read things like this and that's why the holy spirit had to come inside because otherwise it's all external to us and all we've got to rely on is our own natural thoughts and and inclinations and the things that we've learned as children or at school or whatever that's all we would have everything would be Everything would be just out of reach, really, wouldn't it? But because the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us, that that separation, it goes away. It's, it's working actively now. Wherever you go, wherever you're doing, whatever you're doing, it's there in, inside of you. Isn't it amazing that we can communicate so easily to people on the other side of the world but people can't communicate to God who's right there. You know, we've got folks in Canada right now in, in live time um, that we're able to talk to and see and all that sort of stuff. And yet, and yet he who is the greatest of all is a mystery. Can't communicate with him for so, so many people. I found this little story. I found it actually a while ago. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's absolutely true because I, I don't know these people. I didn't really verify it, but um, it made the point that I wanted to make. So I'm going to read it anyway. So um, it says it was a true story now. So I'm just taking it at face value. But anyway, it's a story about two twins and um, they are going around the United States. They're traveling around the United States and they come to a place where uh, the uh, the experience of receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, being baptized in water, all of that was being was being preached, and they both went in uh, to see 
uh, what was what was happening, uh, what's what's going on sort of thing. And they go in there and they're impressed with what they see and they hear. And so they decide together that they would come back the, the, the next night um, to, to, that, to that meeting. And at the very last minute, one of the twins decided uh, not to go, despite the other twin uh, trying to talk him uh, uh, into it. And so one went in and got spirit filled and the story goes, lived a, a great life in the Lord. The, the other who didn't go in went uh, onto a life of drug dependency and was later found killed in Cuba. That's, that's how the story goes. And if you think of that, I mean, whether it's true or not, whether you th if you think of that, they both stood at the same door. They both had the same opportunity. They were both offered the same promise exactly the same <coughs> promise to these two um to these two twins and a choice was made and uh a destiny for each of them was secured at that at that door and um one went to the atlantic and one went to the pacific the thing about that rain is it's quite interesting. It's literally a matter of an inch or so either side, depend which ocean that drop of rain uh, ends up in. It, it's it's a very small um, margin of error if you want to if you want to call it that. Not that the drop of rain cares which which thing it goes to, but that's the that's the point. Um, one opened the door to the promise, and one and one didn't. And uh, I'm sure we can all remember, I remember thinking, um, you know, the, the day that I received the spirit, which was at a prayer and fast, it turns out, I remember thinking to myself, I really have no idea what's going to happen from here, but I know that everything's going to be very, very different. And, um, you know, I didn't know what, it, what was going to be different, but I knew it was going to be very, very different. In John 10, Jesus said this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Even our testimony begins with standing at a door and deciding if we'll go through it or even if we'll knock on it. And um, are we going to go through that, through that door? You know, I often think when I was sitting at that bus stop outside the Vogue, and, uh, and then somebody invited me to go to a play. Uh, why would I have said yes to that? That's the last thing. I, going to a play, are you serious? It's the last thing I'd ever want to do of any kind of play. And yet Saturday night came and there I am watching this, watching this, this play, you know. What, what makes us do those things? Um, don't know, but... Um, I'm sure I'm, I know I'm glad I did it. I'm sure you're glad you walked through the door that, um, that, that you walked through as well. Um, in verse um, 61, um, sorry, verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard all of this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And when Jesus knew it himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend out where he was before, it is the spirit that quickens or makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe, uh, that believe, uh, believe not. Um, the truth of God offends people. And um, it does it because it's divisive. And it also does it because I think people recognise a division going on, even if they don't put it into those, uh, into those, into those terms. There, the flesh, he says, there profits nothing. The promise of the spirit has a promise unto eternity. Again, that great, that great, uh, that great divide there. 
Verse 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him of my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also, uh, will you also go away? What, what are you going to do? Which direction are you going to go in? And you know, that that verse 67 and that and that question there doesn't doesn't just apply to brand new people it doesn't just apply to um someone who's thinking about you know should i follow god or should i not follow god it definitely applies to them but it applies to each and every one of us every single day what are we going to do will something happen will something come up that will make you think that's enough. I'm going to go and do this, whatever the this might be. And we've all known people that have that have done that. And some of them have been in the Lord, you know, 10, 20, 30 plus years, and yet have still got to that point. Will you also go away? Simon Peter, of course, has the perfect answer to this question in verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the anointed, the son of the living God. You, you couldn't have given a better answer than that, could you? He, he, he made his choice. Peter's making a choice right at this time. He would have heard those same words that those other guys said about eating my flesh and and drinking my blood and all this sort of stuff. And maybe even Peter thought, hmm, don't quite understand that, but you have the words of eternal life. Whether I understand it or not, I'm still going to follow you. And you reveal it unto me at some point, as it was revealed unto him, as it's been revealed, um, revealed unto us. We believe and are, and are sure. You know, it's, he didn't have his fingers crossed when he said this. That you are the son of the living of the of the living God, and every day in our life we are confronted by the great divide. Every day, work, Lord, kids, Lord, family, Lord, meeting, Lord, outreaching, Lord, praying, whatever whatever it is we're going to do. Every day we're confronted by the great divide. It's so important. We, unlike the water, which just falls wherever it falls, we've got a choice. We stand at a door. We can knock on that door. We can open that door. We can go into that door. And, uh, and that's where the promise is, if we make that right choice. Um, Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. One interesting thing about that is, in order for you to do that, you've got to know which one's the sheep and which one's the goat. Now, we might look at them and say, well, that's obviously a goat and that's obviously a sheep. You've still got to know that. Right, you still have to know which what does a sheep look like and what does a goat look like, because if you don't know that, you can't possibly separate them. And this is why the Holy Ghost is given with evidence, with some tangible thing. You know, we know Jesus knows all things, but the sheep are identified as sheep. Why? Because they look like sheep. How are we identified as being on that right side? through the evidence that God gives us. He gives us that Holy Spirit. We're baptized in water. We get that evidence. We speak in tongues. So there's no confusion. There's no ambiguity. There's so much ambiguity in this world about who's saved, who's not, uh, get a warm feeling, make a decision for Christ. Um, all of these things, sign a card or something. It's almost like whatever we do, we've got to get God out of the picture, and that's how we'll do it. Where it's so much easier, isn't it? Just let God do it. Just let him do it for you. And uh, he's able 
to uh, to make that distinction. Um, we've of course got a, a free will choice. Some people have made a choice, but hallelujah, until the Lord comes back, you can get on the other side of the great divide. It's set in stone for the water. It ain't set in stone for for people. You can you can go. Um, you can go from the flesh side to the to the to the Jesus side. He said, uh, "Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world." Talks about, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord." Who's going to do that? How is he going to? How is he going to decide all of that? Well, he's told us. We need to. We need to choose. You know. It's like that, uh, what's that um, um, the Harrison Ford thing, the uh, uh, Indiana Jones, and the guy goes into, you know, one of these is the is the Holy Grail, pick which one it is. And uh, the, the, the guy goes in and sees the big flashy one and picks that one. And, uh, and the, the knight that's in there, he says, he chose poorly. <laughs> and then Harrison Ford comes in, saves the day, picks up the, little old wooden one he chose wisely they're the two choices we have to choose wisely to choose poorly the one who chose poorly acted upon his own natural senses what would it be oh it's going to be gold it's going to be flashy it's going to have jewels all over it that's got to be it it ain't he chose poorly hallelujah each of one of us to this time has chosen wisely the advice is keep choosing wisely. Fall on the right side of that divide. Ultimately, we have a great reward coming, don't we? Praise the Lord. All the people said that will do.